All right, I'm good? Sure. All right. I'm getting sound out there? Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. We're going to get started here uh, in a moment. Uh, my name is Tim Apnell. I'm a uh, principal product manager. Uh, until recently, I was actually with our uh, professional services group here working for James. Uh, prior to joining uh, Ansible, I, I've been with Ansible about a year. Uh, but before that, I actually uh, ac was a user of Ansible since version 0 0.5, which means I've actually been using Ansible longer than Ansible's been a company. Mm -hmm. So I kind of know this product pretty well. And this is. Hey guys, I'm James Martin. Mm -hmm. I am the uh, automation practice lead for Ansible. So we deal with all things um, uh, services related for Ansible, professional services related. Um, uh, like Tim, I was working for Ansible prior to the acquisition by Red Hat um, and also was an Ansible user, although maybe Ansible 1.0, not 0 0.05. So. Right. so you're a newbie. <laughs> yeah, I'm a newbie. Yeah, yeah all right. <laughs> no, in all actuality, James and I have seen a lot, a lot of different Ansible installs, a lot of different Ansible usage. Uh, so we thought we'd do a presentation on you know, the things to do right and not so right. Um, before I get started, though, I just want to get a sense of who's out there. Uh, how many people are using Ansible? OK, well, about half the room, mm -hmm. 2 thirds. How many would consider themselves expert? All right. All right. We, we want to hire you. Come talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> you don't work for Red Hat already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so OK, good. That's just giving you an idea. So um, what we're going to be covering here is um, mostly related to what we call our core product, the open source tool, the command line tool that everyone knows and loves. Uh, this was a topic that as, as James and I were working through it, we realized how big best practices really is if we went into the development and tower and all these other things it would become. So this is going to focus on the essentials, the core part of, of Ansible usage. Um, so um, I'm going to start off with what we call the Ansible way. Uh, you know, Ansible's a Swiss army knife of DevOps out there. It is incredibly flexible and can adapt to a lot of different uh, automation tasks, a lot of different environments, a lot of different workflows. We try not to uh, force one on you. That being said, not all approaches are created equally. Uh, so what we're here to present is a way to not undermine the simplicity and power of Ansible and to get the most out of the tool. So um, with that said, we're going to start off with these uh, core principles of ours, that everything that we're going to talk about falls under one of these themes or maybe multiple uh, versions of this theme. And so the first is that when you're building your Ansible content, when you are creating your plays, really strive for simplicity. Um, that is a core principle of everything we do at Ansible. Like our core engineers, all of us, always are talking about, is this as simple as we can make it? Is this going to keep things simple for the end user to get their work done? So we suggest you try to do the same. Uh, another thing is to optimize the Ansible content and what you're creating to be readable. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that your playbooks as being YAML-based and very English-based and not being programming code is that it can become uh, living documentation for your system and how your system works. One of the advantages and one of the reasons that Ansible's had such upkeep is that you can pull out a playbook and show it to someone who's not an Ansible user, a little bit technical, but not an Ansible user, and they can read that along and see what is happening. What is going to happen when I run this playbook? What is the state the machine's going to be left in? I've had salespeople look at Ansible playbooks and understand what they do. So. Exactly. I've bank auditors who there you are go. even less intelligent. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I work for a large bank in America, I'll just say, uh, before coming to Ansible. Uh, so the other third concept is that uh, to think declaratively. Our playbooks, uh, the, is not, they are not for programming. They are not 
the, the YAML-based syntax that we use is not a programming language. We occasionally get ugly tweets that people think it is, but it's not. So really think about how, what is the state I want to achieve here, and declaring what that is, and then letting Ansible do its thing to uh, get you to that point. So uh, as I said, a lot of, th these are the most theoretical points that we're gonna talk about and the least concrete, but as hopefully you see as we go through this, that these points, uh, uh, well, these uh, themes are a lot of the other best practices fall under these, and we'll keep referring back to these type of things. Okay. So now we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about workflow. So one of our first recommendations and best practice uh, as you're working with Ansible content is to create uh, a style guide for you and your developers to work from. YAML works really great with having a uh, certain uh, white space, but it also helps to have things like tagging. How are you gonna name your tasks, name your plays, name your files? How are you gonna lay out the project directories and your repos uh, that your Ansible content is going to live in? Um, and then to have a way to enforce that style. Use things like um, um, post commit hooks that check that hey, you did the right thing here, that this is meeting the style um, that we've laid out. I was just gonna say some of the customers we've had, they've been working a lot of independent siloed teams and they're all doing something a little bit differently. Yeah. So then it makes it difficult for you to share your content if people aren't using uh, and constructing their, their Ansible content in a similar way. Right. Um, another thing, and this, this almost comes without the saying, but we still run into people that don't do this, is to version control your Ansible content, version control your plays, your roles, uh, you know, treat your Ansible content like it's code. It's not code, but treat it like code and version it as such. Version it, put it in your uh, version control system, whatever that is, whether it's Git subversion um, or, or uh, I don't know what other tools, uh, <laughs> I guess we don't, yeah. <laughs> Uh, CVS. Oh yeah, CVS, I don't know, do we even support that? But if you want to, you can use CVS, go ahead. Um, uh, the other thing is to iterate your work. Uh, one uh, common mistake that I see when I talk to a lot of uh, enterprise customers who first pick up Ansible, for some reason they always seem to be Java programmers, they immediately go to like hmm. modularizing the, everything that they're doing and, and dependencies on top of dependencies with, it's, it's sort of madness. Uh, what I really recommend you do, start off with a simple playbook, something that, that works enough, and then refactor and modularize once you have that playbook working, because it, it's a lot more difficult to debug, a lot more difficult to work with when you're dealing with six, eight different files all over uh, a, a file system. Um, it just goes a lot faster when you can do it that way. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit here now about some project layouts and the way that we recommend, uh, or at least guidelines for uh, how these things work. Um, in this case here, this is just a basic project layout. So we have a project name, basic project. We have our .yaml files, which are a few different playbooks that we have in this project. And in this case, we're using static inventory, so we have a subdirectory called inventory that has our host file and it has uh, subdirectories for the different uh, variables that are associated to our hosts and our groups in there. So pretty basic starting point for just getting something quick done. Um, as time progresses, you may find, and as you iterate and expand, you might wanna start to organize your playbooks and break them up and modularize them into roles. In this case here, we're embedding the roles in the same project uh, repository. The reason is that the roles we're assuming here are only relevant to your current playbooks. You're doing this for organizational reasons. You wanted to package it up, modularize it, kind of you know, tuck that off to the side while you work on some other things. So here we have uh, what's different in this one is we have a role subdirectory and under that you have a subdirectory for each of your roles and they have all the files that go as part of an Ansible role under there. Over time, and if you're in a large enough organization, you will want to start sharing your roles. 
So that is, hey, I have a, uh, you know, I'm a DevOps team and I've created a, a, a MySQL role, an Apache role. Uh, maybe it's, it's a uh, in-house made proprietary application that you've created a role for. And you now want to share it because other teams in your organization, in other regions or other business units, want to make use of your role. So in this case here, you can use uh, or this requirements.yaml file and the Ansible Galaxy tool. And then that allows um, you to very easily pull from a shared repository different roles, whether those are uh, the Ansible Galaxy public roles or if they're your own internal ones that are held in um, uh, some type of version control system behind your firewall. We'll be going over roles more and we'll come back to this uh, in a bit. Uh, last thing is, uh, under workflow here, not the last best practice, but uh, is to use an editor with syntax highlighting. There's a, a number of different, uh, you know, the most popular editor supported, there's Vim plugins for it, uh, that they really help out you identify maybe a syntax error or something maybe you got a little bit off or wrong. Um, I also think it makes it a lot easier to read when I open it up, like, okay, there, there are my tasks, here, here are my parameters, things like that. So it just makes things a lot easier to use um, an editor that has that type of, of syntax highlighting of Ansible content. Um, I think what we have pictured here on the right is Adam? Uh, yes, that's Adam, yeah. Right, okay. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some best practices around uh, using inventories uh, with Ansible. Um, firstly, uh, one of the key components, especially when using a static inventory, is to give your inventory some meaningful names. Um, and we're gonna talk about each of these bullet points in, in the following slides. Um, using inventory groups uh, as much as possible on, and using a single source of truth uh, when you can. Uh, any, anybody here using uh, dynamic inventory by any chance in Ansible. Okay, just one, two, three, four, five, okay. Just a few people, okay, good. Um, so what do we mean by uh, uh, meaningful names? Well, on the right-hand side, you see a collection of IP addresses uh, and host names, and these would, could live in your inventory, but they don't make a lot of sense. Um, they don't really describe what those machines in the inventory are doing. On the right-hand side, uh, what we've done is, is taking those same IP addresses and host names, but giving some logical descriptors, if you will, of those uh, devices. So the very first uh, string you see, like DB1 or Web1, is what we would call an inventory host name, and that's a logical name. It doesn't have to be resolvable. Um, followed by Ansible underscore host, and then an IP address or a uh, host name, a resolvable host name that actually um, points to the device um, um, that you're managing with Ansible. Um, so that makes it a lot uh, easier when you're executing um, a playbook. You can see the results uh, as you know, web one, web two, web three, uh, and makes it also easier uh, to describe the functions um, of those machines in your inventory as well. Inventory groups. So taking what we did on the previous slide, and we had those logical names, DB, um, one through four and web one through four. We can now assign these to groups. So here I have a DB group and I'm using a shorthand mechanism here to um, say that the DB servers one through four belong to the DB group. And I'm saying the web servers one through four belong to the web group. But then I've also ha have additional groups based on the region where they live, their geographic location. Um, there is a group based on their environment, production testing, um, staging, et cetera. Um, and, and you can do nice, you can do really neat things with inventory groups such as uh, intersections. So when you're running a playbook, you could say, I want, um, all, I want to execute this playbook against all my DB servers in the dev environment, right? And you can specify to do an intersection with that. So the more groups you've subdivided your uh, hosts into, the more um, targeted uh, Ansible playbooks, uh, playbook runs you can make. Right. That, oh, sorry, if you yeah. just... By one say. Yep. That's a very common pattern that we see that in large organizations is they will break, they will have groups for uh, application type or stack, uh, region, and then stage. And then a, one host will belong to a group in one of those major categories like that so that they can target, like James said, DB servers in the east that are in testing. 
Um, dynamic inventory. So there's only a handful of folks that are using dynamic inventory. Um, so how many people have custom CMDBs in-house? So not, okay. So what a, what a dynamic inventory can do for you with a, if you have a custom CMDB. Um, dynamic inventory would allow Ansible to talk to uh, your CMDB and use that as its uh, system of authority um, for the machines that uh, live in, in your inventory and are to be managed by Ansible. So rather than having to go into your CMDB and copy and paste IP addresses and host names from your CMDB to um, um, the Ansible uh, inventory file, you would write a dynamic inventory script that would fetch that data um, um, displayed in a particular uh, JSON data structure that Ansible can interpret. Um, and, and then you don't ever have to do that transcription anymore, right? So that's gonna reduce your human error because you're not gonna have to manage those IP addresses by hand inside of Ansible. Um, in addition to doing, working with custom CMDBs, there's a, a ton of uh, uh, dynamic inventory scripts that are included with Ansible uh, core already. I think there's 41 of them. Um, the most popular ones probably are like the, the OpenStack and the, the EC2 and the cloud. Uh, related dynamic inventory scripts. Yeah. Oh, back to me. All right, so we're gonna talk some about variables, which are, you know, a lot of ways the lifeblood of what's happening in your playbook. So another very good practice is to use descriptive, unique, human, meaningful variable names. This is very much, you just heard the same theme in the, uh, inventory section ahead. Uh, another, and it's, it's related to that, is to prefix role variables if, if they're gonna be in a role name or if they're to a specific application. So we have down here an example of kind of both of those uh, things at play, where you have a Apache Max Keep Alive and also an Apache port and a Tomcat port. Now the, the, the bottom two I point your attention to because if you're creating roles and you have a, a, a Tomcat role and an Apache role and you put the variable port, they're gonna start beating each other up and overriding each other depending on which one loads first. And you wanna avoid that. So a good way to do that type of thing is to prefix it with the name of the role that you're uh, putting this in. And it dramatically increases your chance of, uh, or decreases your chance of avoiding that type of naming conflict happening between roles as you bring them in together. Uh, another thing is also to not use uh, what we call bare variables. This is, uh, I have to admit, a practice I sometimes mess up myself when I'm banging out playbooks. Uh, it is now deprecated in version 2.0. So if, if you've written a playbook and done this, you'll see now you get a warning that this has been deprecated. Uh, there's technical reasons for why uh, we need to enforce this a little bit more. So at the top here, I have an example of what you don't want to do. And then below, you want to wrap it in the uh, mustaches and the quotes. The main reason for this is that they had to guess in the top example, the core developers had to guess that you mean that that is a variable, not a string. Where by the bottom one, they know that you mean a variable. And they don't think guesswork is a good idea in software. Hmm. So <laughs> they want to discontinue that practice. Um, another, uh, uh, and this is a good use of variables, uh, is to use, to use them to separate your logic, your tasks, uh, from the variables, and to also reduce repetitive uh, construction of strings. Um, and let me, let me put up an example that might explain this a little better. Here on the left, we have example A, where as if you look down, like you have the file path, it's going to the user's home directory, uh, then you're doing the deployment key, which is the user's uh, SSH uh, subdirectory in their home directory. Again, you see the home directory being used in the destination, the key file. Uh, you, you keep repeating that same pattern through. On the side of B, uh, we've broken it out. It's a little bit more verbose, but we've set that at the top once. And we don't need to now worry about that. that down below, I can use a much more descriptive variable and only use it once. Uh, oh, actually, I should point, okay, so we use uh, user home in the variables that follow it, uh, and then we're able to create variables that below tell us where that goes and what that is. So we have user SSH, not that home username.ssh. 
Um, the other thing that this also opens you up to, uh, the, the possibility to in exhibit B, is that you can now override through uh, facts or through inventory variables, you can override these variables up top where if they're embedded over here, you have no chance of being able to do that sort of thing. So you, you've reduced your flexibility on the left side, where on the right side, for a little bit of extra organization, you now have that new type of flexibility or the possibility of that flexibility. Plays and tasks. This is a long one. Yeah. <laughs> all right, plays and tasks. So pretty much all the work uh, you'll be doing in Ansible uh, revolves around writing plays and tasks. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things we, we've, we've mentioned uh, recently is try to stick to native YAML syntax for your, syntax for your plays. Um, and I'll show what that means. But um, essentially, um, it's going to make it's going to make reading your playbooks easier. Um, and uh, another key component of using native YAML syntax is it supports uh, complex uh, parameter values for your tasks. So when you have things like dictionaries or arrays, uh, you can uh, very easily pass them as uh, parameters um, to uh, your tasks. Uh, so this is an example of what not to do. Um, and this is how we all started writing Ansible playbooks, how I started writing Ansible playbooks, where you have um, your, your module names such as yum, and they start giving these key equals value um, parameters. The problem is some of these modules take a lot of parameters. At some point, they're going to stretch really long, far past uh, maybe the, the length of your screen, and you have to scroll uh, to read these, and, and you're going to be scrolling back and forth, and it's going to be difficult to read. Um, so a minor improvement um, you might have seen uh, some people do is using this um, greater than character and uh, that allows you to specify these um, keys on a, uh, a multi-line instead of yeah. going across horizontally. Um, but as you can see, it doesn't, it's not giving you any syntax highlighting, right? That's to, to the syntax highlighter that just looks like one big block of text. Um, and you still aren't able to pass um, a, a complex uh, uh, parameter values in, in, a, in a very clean way. So what we recommend is, is using this native YAML format. So every, this is uh, a YAML list, um, and um, you'll have the module name, um, and then beneath the uh, module name are the parameters to the module and the values to the module. So you're no, no longer using um, key equal value um, to describe the parameters to your tasks. Uh, you are using um, just strict uh, na uh, native YAML format. Um, human meaningful names again, the same thing we've been talking about for variables and talking about for inventory. Do the same thing with, with your tasks. Uh, here in host, uh, exhibit A, rather, uh, we have a playbook that's uh, starting, uh, installing and starting Apache. And uh, we don't, we, we're not giving those tasks any name. In exhibit B, I've given, uh, so we're not giving the play any name, nor are we giving the task a name. Exhibit B, I'm giving the play a name, which is installs and starts Apache, so that's the name of the play. And then the name of the tasks uh, are install Apache packages and starts Apache packages. But what does this get you? What, what, what's the, what difference does this make? Well, this is the difference. Exhibit A, which doesn't have any names, doesn't really, it's not really descriptive when you run the Ansible playbook what, what it's doing. This is the output of Ansible playbook for those two plays. All I see is it's running a play against the web host, and it's um, uh, it's running yum and it's, and it's running service. It's not uh, very helpful. Um, exhibit B, which had the descriptive names, tells me what the play is doing and then tells me what each individual task, uh, task is doing. So uh, make, make it a point um, to name um, all of your plays. Don't be verbose, but n name them uh, succinctly enough to, for someone to, who's reading them to understand uh, what they're doing. Um, when, you're, when you're working with um, playbooks, try to stay away from having large monolithic playbooks, playbooks that are trying to do everything across your inventory and are very, and a very conditional focused. I don't really have an example of this because it's, uh, it would be a massively long playbook and probably take the rest of our time to describe, to show you what it looks like. But Maybe. we've come across customers who will have like a site.yaml and in that site.yaml they are referencing you know, a hundred different inventory yeah. groups, 
And yeah. that after every play, it's like when this uh, host is belong in this group and when this host is belong in this group. And so they run this playbook anytime they want to do any work uh, on, on their site and you just end up with uh, an unnecessary amount of tasks that are being skipped. Um, and it's just not a well uh, organized, uh, a well way to run your Ansible playbooks. So we right. instead recommend you uh, split up your playbooks into uh, more uh, focused and, and purpose built um, um, playbooks and rather than uh, monolithic playbooks. And good, good, good luck debugging that monolithic playbook, right. man. Yeah. <laughs> if you have something to, breaks and you're, you're trying and you, to figure out why. And you have to wait five minutes for it to finish. And, yeah, yeah, so yeah. The, the smaller the units of your playbook are, uh, the better. Of course, there, there's always considerations there, but um, try to keep it simple. Um, separate your configuration and uh, provisioning tasks. So for folks, who, anybody using Ansible in the cloud here? A, OpenStack, AWS, okay. So think about splitting up your uh, provisioning phase from your configuration phase. So when I say provisioning phase, I am talking about uh, the steps that are needed to provision your cloud infrastructure. So that might be uh, you know, setting up an elastic load balancer and uh, spinning up some EC2 instances. Yeah. Um, and the, the second phase uh, would be configuring those machines. Um, so that might be you know, installing Apache on those machines you, you configured. The benefit to doing that is if you ever decide to change cloud providers or, or, or VM providers, you can still reuse the same configure playbook because it doesn't care where you actually did the provisioning. So you would just change the provision or you add a different provision. You get a provision EC2, provision OpenStack, et cetera. Right. Um, and the other thing you can do is with the site.yaml, you can include playbooks um, inside, of an, uh, inside of a playbook. So I could say, let's, if I ran the site.yaml playbook, go ahead and include the provision play, playbook, and after that's run, it's going to run uh, the configure, play, uh, configure playbook. Right. So um, it gives you the ability to run it as a monolithic playbook, but also run it as individual playbooks as well. Um, when you are using uh, Ansible, uh, and you're writing um, Ansible tasks, uh, try to stay away from using the command module uh, and only use it as a last resort. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show you, show you why that in a second. Yeah. The, second uh, uh, the second point is the command module, it, it, if you have to use it, is safer than using the shell module. Um, so sometimes when there aren't Ansible modules, you have to, you have to run a shell command on that system. Um, if you were to use the shell command, uh, the, the shell, uh, module, it can evaluate um, uh, shell characters like pipe and, and redirect and that sort of thing. The command module cannot. So it's a little bit safer in the sense that if you pass as a variable to the command module um, some redirects, it will escape those. So you don't get any people doing nefarious things with variables and trying to do some variable injection of, of shell redirectors inside right. of your your plays. The one other thing about uh, run commands I always point out to customers who are just like, ah, I didn't want to read the manual and I know how to do this in shell, so I'm just going to use this, is that the, the Ansible in general is a desired state engine. So when you tell it install something with yum, mm -hmm. it checks, is that already installed? Yep. Oh, it is? All right, I don't need to do anything. I'm going to move on, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <It's all right>. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> so always seek out a well, module first. I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> I was also going to say, because it, it, the, the shells don't always come back as a change. Sure. It, yeah. it doesn't have the logic to say, oh, yeah, that, that directory's already been removed. Right. It'll try to remove it and error out, right. for example. So uh, like Tim was saying, uh, on exhibit A versus exhibit B here, I, exhibit A have done pure uh, all commands. Because say I'm new to Ansible and I didn't, I'd never read the documentation, which please read documentation. Yeah. Um, so I decided I'm just going to run shell commands. Well, this is, this is dumb for a couple of reasons, so mainly because if you're doing this, you're essentially just writing a shell script in YAML and that doesn't make any sense. Um, so don't do that. Um, uh, secondly, like Tim was saying, th these commands aren't, typically aren't uh, smart enough to know what the state of the machine uh, already is. So if you were to run the user ad app user, the first time you, you ran it and nobody was, the app user wasn't created, it would create it and, and not give you any problems. If you were to run it again, it would most likely give you an error. Well, some of these commands are smarter. Um, the yum command obviously knows if the package is already installed and service already knows that it's installed, uh, that a, a service has started or stopped. Um, but uh, you can see here I've done things with uh, uh, using the command module, then I'm using the shell module here 
which is a bad thing, which was showing in the last slide and using uh, an ampersand to, to spin off another command on the successful run of the HTTPD start. Well, instead of doing that, if you used all native modules, you get a, not only a much cleaner uh, looking playbook, you, you get uh, the benefit that Ansible is going to do the state checking uh, for you and you won't have to, um, um, you, you, don't, you, you don't have to worry about the commands uh, failing um, because they're not smart enough to detect, to detect the, the, the right. state change that needs to happen. Um, there's two ways to look for the, our Ansible modules. So you can run Ansible doc on the command line and give it a module name. So there's, I think, up around 500 different, uh, yeah, modules, yeah. 500 different modules now. Um, you can also go to the Ansible documentation website. We have modules split out by category uh, and an index of all the modules as well. Um, so a feature that was added in Ansible 2.1 uh, helps a lot with debugging. Um, you can specify a debug uh, task that always displays. So maybe you just want to dump some value out uh, in your playbook output uh, all the time. But then you also have the ability to uh, dump a, a debug message only uh, when a specific uh, verbosity level is defined on the command line. Yeah. So that's the second example here. So um, this, this, that message will only dis be displayed when you give a double V uh, to uh, Ansible playbook, and you can define that level of verbosity in the Ansible uh, dot config yeah. file. This is just kind of a hygiene thing. It's, I've seen production code where the developer of the playbook leapt in all these debug messages, so an ops guy's running it, and they're seeing all these like JSON dumps. A lot of noise. A lot of noise yeah. flying through, and they don't know, is that bad? That doesn't yeah. look good, yeah. you know? <laughs> Um, uh, one one uh, point I wanted to make here, um, a lot of people when they're using Ansible will just start a service and then walk away, yeah, the service started, we're done. It doesn't really work that way as most of you have probably experienced uh, dealing with systems. You either have an, some uh, enterprise Java application that you ran the init script, you ran the startup script and it said it started, but in reality you know that it takes you know 198 seconds to do it. and. Um, you actually have to wait for that thing to be running before you can continue. So you should, instead of just starting the service, you should actually check and pull it to make it, make sure it's actually up. Um, one of the ways you can do that here, um, using the URI module, um, checking um, a, a, a URL that's local to the machine where Ansible uh, is executing its scripts, um, and I'm waiting for hello world to return in this response. Once hello world has been returned, I consider it up and running, and I'm doing this with a, essentially an until loop um, where I am trying to do this 10 times, the delay of one second between each try, and if that uh, fails, if it goes through 10 times and never finds it, then the task fails. Um, you can also use what, the wait for module that yeah. can uh, look for ports to become alive. It can also do a really neat thing and look inside of a log file and wait for a regular expression um, to appear in a log file before um, uh, you move on to the next task. Um, for folks who are using the command module a lot, um, again, I've seen this happen where people are using, I've made up this command called certify, I'm just gonna pretend it's creating uh, certificates. Um, so somebody uh, needs to create a, a cert and uh, sign a cert. If you had to do this without a module, it becomes very painful, right? The first thing you would have to do is write uh, a shell task that is going to list out the um, uh, certificates that you currently had to see if you needed to create one and you had to register an output. And then you needed to create a cert uh, when, the output of, uh, when the output of the previous task did not find the certificate name that you've defined as a variable. And the third task, then you gotta sign the cert, um, um, but, only when, but only when the create cert task was created, and this is a pain, and it's hard to read, and it's hard to understand, and if you start seeing patterns like this, where you're running some command uh, in your environment over and over and over again, it's making your playbooks, again, start to look like shell scripts, consider making your own custom module for it. Now, we're not gonna get into writing custom modules in detail here, because that's a whole nother uh, hour-long session, but here I've combined all of that logic into a fake module I've called certify, where I'm just saying certify, um, module, state present, sign yes, user Chris, name, cert name, and cert store. And now the module is behind the scenes is doing all that similar logic, but it's abstracting it away from your user and keeping it clean, simple, easy to read, human readable, 
uh, et cetera. Um, there is a link at the bottom there on developing modules. You can just search for developing right. modules with Ansible, and there's a whole uh, a lot of guidelines there about how to develop modules right. with Ansible. The great part about the modules is now you have the full power of Python at your disposal. And like I said, playbooks are not uh, a very good programming language, because they're not. It's not a programming language at all. So by moving it into a module, you now have all Python to work with and to do much more sophisticated things and logic. And that's the whole point of modules. Modules are there to do the heavy lifting and abstract users away, as James just said, uh, from all that complexity. So uh, we're going to do a, a little bit on templates. Uh, so Ansible uh, embeds the Jinja 2 template engine. And that is very powerful if anyone's uh, worked with uh, Flask and there's a whole bunch Django. of other. Uh, yeah, Django more or less, right? Uh, even though we've put it there and we, we've, we've both embedded and make it available to you, uh, you don't have to use all of it. Uh, it. This is where you want to keep things simple, want to keep things straightforward, keep it readable. So, you know, things like we shy away from is not doing all this variable substitution or uh, excessive amounts of conditionals, uh, you know, we say, the, well, actually, yeah, sorry. The head towards uh, more simple control structures, uh, you know, design your templates for your use case, not to handle every possibility in the world of a configuration file. Uh, so conversely, I just realized I was getting ahead of myself again, uh, was these are the type of things you actually want to avoid. Uh, in your templates, things like setting and managing variables inside of your template, uh, doing extensive and intricate conditionals. Uh, conditional logics based on host name. That was one that James and I were talking about when we were putting this together, is he was just in a client that they wrote templates and then they hard coded the name of certain uh, hosts in there and had all this conditional logic. If it's this, use that. If it's this group, use right. that. It, it, so they, they've re effectively recreated the functionality of inventory variables, but did it inside of a, a template, right? Right, yeah. right. And they put a ton of a ton of different logic in there. Um, they probably would have been better off having separate templates and then making a conditional call to the right template based on that um, host. Uh, and one other thing, uh, you know, it's any type of really complex iterations, you might be misusing templates inside of uh, like, a, inside. like a five level deep dictionary or something that right. you're evaluating. Yeah, 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 yeah. things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fun stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a little, little helpful thing I found here is when you are creating a template, to put a comment in there that labels that, hey, this was generated by, temp, uh, by Ansible, uh, it, I, it, it helps someone understand uh, if another ops person comes across that config file, like, hey, where did this come from? It also kind of puts out a warning to that person, like, don't manually change this file because it's going to get overwritten the next time a playbook runs. <laughs> so it's, it's, like I said, it's, I find it's a, it's a good idea. We do have something in there called uh, Ansible Managed. It's a variable that outputs the, the file and the modification date and some other good stuff, and if you, uh, mix it with the uh, comment filter, it'll automatically comment it for you. So you don't have to worry about doing that escaping. Oh, I so didn't even know it. that. That's yeah, cool. I know, That's isn't cool. that cool? Yeah. You, you can even pick the commenting type. Oh, cool. It uses pound, but yeah. you can do like C and nice. yeah. yeah. Uh, the one caveat and the reason that you see two asterisks there is that Ansible Manage puts the date in there. So the problem with that is every time the template generates, it's going to be different than the one that was there previously, even if nothing else inside it changed. <laughs> I'm not a fan of that, but I'm not on the core engineering team, and I'm not you exactly sure. You can actually what? specify what that managed string yes, is. Yes, you can override yes, it, but by can, default, right. it outputs the, right. the date in there, and then you run into this cycle of your template always, uh, your, you know, your template always updates the file every time you run your playbook, and you may not want that. So, little caveat, but I still recommend looking to use it. Um, all right, so that was it for templates. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about roles. We've been dropping it there. Hopefully you knew what we were talking about. We're gonna talk a, a little bit, about some best practices like that. So, first one, like playbooks, keep your roles purpose and function focused. Uh, a common mistake I see people do is they create one Uber role role that does the provisioning, does the installation, does the configuration of uh, sometimes multiple system components in one big role. 
Uh, I recommend not doing that. Keep it, keep it focused on what that role does. It has a specific purpose. Leave it at that. Uh, also, put your roles uh, in a subdirectory when it's for organizational clarity. This is referring back to when I sh uh, a slide earlier when I had uh, a, talked about organizational roles and the type of layout. When you, you want to use those when your playbooks are starting to become a bit big and unwieldy and you want to start to modularize it and break it up into uh, concise packages that you can better uh, maintain and manage. Uh, the other thing is to uh, follow the Ansible Galaxy pattern for roles, uh, especially uh, if you're going beyond a, um, you're heading towards having shared roles and that are going to live beyond a, a certain project. Uh, the reason being that gives you the possibility of uh, using the Ansible Galaxy command line tool. And a good way to enforce that roles layout is to use the init uh, subcommand. So start your roles off with the init subcommand, develop your stuff or cut and paste your basic uh, playbook material into the different spots within a role. The one other thing, this is my one little pet peeve I see, is people run Ansible Galaxy init, and they get all these stubs, and they get all the different subdirectories you might need, and then they use maybe three of them. Mm -hmm. And then they leave eight of them, and I'm going through to understand what that role does, and I'm opening up empty files. And they never, they never change the they, meta information. They never the change the meta information, yeah, yeah. so they have all this, like, <laughs> all the possible choices of right. if you're going to submit it to Galaxy. Yeah. Uh, my email address is me at example.com, yeah. mm -hmm. and yeah. So another best practice is to then, once you use the init command and you get your initial role developed, is to clean out all those stubs that the uh, init uh, built for you. And the other is to use Ansible Galaxy to install your roles. Ansible Galaxy is, is, is a public repository for roles, but it is also this command line tool that lets you work with your own internal private repos. So if you're following the, the Ansible Galaxy layouts and you're putting a role, uh, each role has its own repo, you can use Ansible Galaxy to install your roles using that requirements.yaml file I had in my um, the, was it the shared project um, layout? So it makes things a lot easier uh, that you can just put that manifest file in there, run this, boom, you get, it pulls the roles from all the different parts of your uh, repository or some from uh, Galaxy and some from your internal and brings them all down for your project, uh, your playbooks to use. Uh, roles can live with your app code. So manage your roles in, in an applications repo if it uh, makes sense. Uh, you can also make it something separate uh, that can be shared. So uh, the way to do that is that it can, be, uh, it can be part of your build process. So you can build these and push the role to an artifact repository and then use Ansible Galaxy to pull it down. So one, one use case yeah. we've seen is that um, some application developers are writing their, their Ansible roles to do the deployment of their product and they might have like 50 different template files. Um, and it becomes a pain then if you had, you know, your project, so your ap application source code and then you had your Ansible role um, and that was in a different repo, then you have to copy the, the files back over every single time that your application changed so to make sure your Ansible role is in sync with your application uh, source code, right? So in, 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 the, in the sense of the, uh, of the template file. So the idea here is just put a Ansible directory in your, in your, in your application's uh, source code and develop your role, your deployment role for that application right there. That way, the Ansible t the playbooks, the logic for the deployment is all sitting along with the particular version of the application um, 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 that, as it exists in, in Git. Um, and then, you know, as part of your build process, essentially um, that Ansible roles directory is getting chunked away, zipped up, and sent to some artifact repository, artifactory, nexus, whatever, and then use, using Ansible Galaxy, like Tim was talking about before, to pull that, um, um, that role from that artifact repository. So then, then your role is always in sync with exactly what your, uh, what your application, uh, what version of your application you're trying to deploy. Okay. All right, and so uh, starting to wrap up here, scaling your Ansible workflow. So if you're using uh, the Ansible command line tool and you are finding yourself in a position, you've now 
created Ansible automation, you, know, you have different people in your teams using it, you start to run into these situations. You need to coordinate the Ansible usage across distributed organizations, uh, different locations, different continents, uh, different business units. Uh, you need to control the access to the credentials, the private keys, the passwords to databases and things. You need to track and audit uh, uh, who ran what when, uh, what were the results of that. Uh, or uh, you want to tell an end, you, or you, you, you want to offload uh, responsibilities, this mundane stuff uh, from your ops team because they don't have an intern to do it for them. Uh, you can give them some type of self-service or a delegation. Uh, or the other is that you need to integrate Ansible with uh, an enterprise system. These are the reasons that you need to start looking into or, or deploy Ansible Tower. Um, I'm not going to give a sales pitch more yeah. than that. If you want to we'll pitch, come to our that. booth. Yeah, if you want to pitch, come to our booth. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I love how Google Slides does this, by the uh, way. This looked beautiful last night. Uh, and that was before I started drinking, so anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, a couple things, though, before we take some questions. Uh, we just wanted to point out that in a month, we're having our user uh, festival. We have three of these a year. It just so happens in a month, our next one is going to be here in San Francisco. So if you're local to the Bay Area or you can travel back here, please come join us. Uh, uh, it, yes, July 28th, there it is. Uh, uh, it'll be, I believe, at the St. Francis up here by Union Square, so not very far from where we're at now. Uh, please come and join. Uh, we talk about a lot of different topics, uh, business, technical, meet end users, things like that. And then uh, tomorrow, uh, a team member from my team, John Davila, will be uh, doing an interactive discovery session. So uh, in the consulting side, the discovery session is when we go to a, uh, a client's um, office and we get all the stakeholders uh, from a client in a room and under, try to get an understanding what their automation um, use cases are and how a consulting discovery, uh, sorry, a consult, an Ansible consulting uh, um, um, solution could help them reach their automation goals. Uh, so you come on, you can come out to that tomorrow at 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. and I believe they'll be serving free beer, which is um, always a Ooh. plus for those who are interested. All right, all right. Um, and with that, um, if we have any questions, uh, yes. Uh, we'll be uh, giving it to the, the conference organizers and they'll be posting it with all the other slides yeah. that we have, yeah, so. Um, you ha yeah. Yes. I would say you, you for every for every role you would have its own repo. Um, yeah, and then you manage which version of the role you want to deploy yeah. using the requirements.yaml file and, and using uh, Ansible Galaxy's ability to pull um, that um, tagged versioned role from your version right. control system. Right. So, sorry, the, the question was, how do you version roles? Uh, what, what's about, yeah, and as James was just saying, the Ansible Galaxy lets you pick a, uh, let's say, a tag in Git or even a specific uh, commit by the head, and we actually recommend, I probably should have made it in the slides, to peg it to a, a certain version so that you don't find yourself accidentally being upgraded and things suddenly breaking <laughs> on you. Um, so. Uh, do you have any other? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you. Okay. So take it as, try to deconstruct what the end state is and work backwards from there. So we've done a lot of Ansible consulting engagements for people who are mi migrating off of different platforms to, to Ansible, and you can't do a one-to-one -one migration. It's more, what is this, what is this puppet recipe attempting, or uh, whatever they're called, I forget, chef, puppet, I get the terminology yeah. confused. What is it trying to do, right? And what's, what's that end state, and then let me work backwards from there, because the, the way, the route you get there might not be the same with Ansible, so right. you have to understand what the end state is. Right, right exactly.
Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can come talk to me and more after the yeah. we can Yeah, yeah. After yeah. this, come talk to me with some more. Yeah. So and for the camera, the question was how to migrate from Puppet to Ansible and what strategies. Right. So all right. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I know which one you mean. I don't think it's made it into uh, our core yet, because I was the one doing part of the pull request code review. Uh, yeah, that, right. And, and we, we, we do also have a puppet module in Ansible itself. There, there actually is a small sub-community that manage puppet with Ansible. So, uh, and, and someone in the community, not us, submitted that module to us. So, how are we doing on time? By the way, uh, I think we're pretty close. Uh, Is it 5:45? Uh, 38. So we still got seven minutes. Oh, okay, cool. So yeah, so we're here. Yes. Yeah, tagging. Um, I, you now with, with that we have the um, block feature. Yeah. Um, you can tag like a block of tasks, so you don't have to keep saying the same tag over and over and over again. So that might make tagging e easier. But yeah, try to describe what you're doing. So if you're if you're altering services, like starting and stopping services, tag them with service, for instance, and maybe and, and then you can use uh, roles and tagging. When you're executing a role, you can say apply this tag to this role. So that means if uh, if I had an uh, Apache role, I could say in my playbook um, assign. Um, the tag of Apache to every single task in that role, and it'll automatically fill it in. You wouldn't have to do it manually. So then you just sort of you could give tags based on what that uh, what the action a particular task is doing. But um, I always find taggings have a bit to do with taste. Yeah. Uh, like I'm, I, I try not to put too many tags in. I see some people that put like 12 tags on every task, and yeah. I, I see where they're coming from. And it's one of those. It's hard to say this is the hard and fast best right. practice rule on that. So all, all the way in the back. <laughs> So break it out. Can you break it out into its own playbook, or? Uh -huh. So split split those up into four discrete yeah. playbooks, and then use site.yaml to include those other ones. And you could just run the discrete playbook when you needed to. And you can even you can even tag the inclusion of a playbook. So that if you wanted to run two or three of them consecutively, you could just, at that point, call the site.yaml and give it those three tags, and it will run the three subplays. Sorry, I lost you in that last part. I think it's in the, the area of too many conditionals. If it, if it works for you. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it starts, though, for me personally, it starts to get into maybe too much conditional logic. Yeah. And then that's where we said, you know, break them out into separate ones and then use the ability to include playbooks and kind of create those, like, merged hybrid ones uh, in, in, in your, as, as a separate thing that you could do on the side. So, yeah. Uh, any more questions? All right, we got one there, and then we'll go there. So are people using pull model a lot with Ansible? Uh, not really, not at all. I mean, uh, there, there are some, but not many. Yeah, yeah, it's not anything we recommend people using, really. I mean, it's there. 
Um, and like James said, a few people use it, but for the most part, it's not where our effort is. It's not how we uh, differentiate ourselves or the value we think that we bring right. is a lot of people come to us because they don't like the pull model of other tools. And you lose the orchestration capability. You don't, obviously you don't get the push base, which is a lot, why a lot of people come to Ansible. You don't get the agent list because, well, it still is agent list, but you have to install Ansible. Uh, on the machines that are using Ansible pool, so. And set um, them up to run right. periodically, and right. yeah. And make sure they keep running, right. and yeah. yeah. So, uh, there was one other question, yes? So we're just now uh, setting up Ansible Powers. Okay. And we have the open source and stuff. Okay. So how many of So how to use cloud forms and tower together? I'm not sure. Are you asking from the tower? Are you asking the integration from tower to cloud forms or from cloud forms? I'm not sure if that information is available yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, we are going to have to check back uh, with us it? on that. That's yeah. not an area. Yeah. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who might know a little better than we do right yeah. now. <laughs> So, uh, yes, question there. So what about Aquari and Ansible? Uh, they're kind of vague, but they sort of indicated that perhaps down the line Tower would go open source. Yes. Is there anything you can provide to lead us to believe that's still the case? And or is there a time Formally, no. I would say, if you look at Ansible's, or Red Hat's history, they've open sourced everything, everybody they've ever, yeah, so yeah. yeah. that's all I know. That's above my pay grade. Yeah. What uh, James, tomorrow. Yeah. And it's unofficial answer is no, tomorrow. Well, well, <laughs> well, what, what James said is true, is, is, is Red Hat's track record is, is pretty consistent with what they've done when they've acquired a company that has a proprietary licensed uh, tool. What's, what happens eventually? The question is, well, what is eventually, I guess, is what you're asking uh, more than anything. Um, and I think to add to that, just because now I'm partially on the business side of the house, is that there's a lot to do with uh, licensing and business uh, issues that need to get worked through more than technical ones to go from a proprietary to a open source. I think some of, I mean, if you look at the history also, some of the uh, Ansel, uh, Red Hat's acquisitions have taken a couple of years for the yeah. products to become open source. I think Manage source. IQ was two years. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. And we're only into six, six, well, I would say really six months yeah, after they true. converted all the systems over. So true. we're only six months into it at this point. So it's pretty early to speculate, I think. Yeah. Yes? A public, sorry, can you speak up? Yeah. For Tower? Uh, probably once they open source it, if, if, when, if and when they decide to do that, yeah. I would assume there would be it would be on GitHub or some um, repository you can file issues. Uh, right now, it's all through our, our support team. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. All right, great. Well, thank you for coming out. Thank There's you. a lot more Ansible presentations that are going to be happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Please come see us at Ansible Fest if you don't get to see us at some more of the sessions here. <laughs>